I am not a racist. That thought just keeps pinging around my brain as the institutional integrity officer with his severe buzz cut and his prim, immaculate suit tells me, we have received an anonymous complaint that you have made race-based comments in the workplace. I feel sick. I feel tainted, defiled, besmirched. And I'm afraid. I'm new to this job. I'm still on probation. That means my employer can fire me for any reason or no reason. On top of that, I'm an employment civil rights attorney. <laughs> I have spent the last 20 years of my life fighting discrimination in the workplace. This kind of accusation can not only cost me my job, it can ruin my entire reputation. I, I want to run away. I just want to go home to New Mexico. I have been working so hard ever since I came for this new job, and it's not good for my poor little paralyzed body, but I don't have anything to go back to. I left a good job where I was well respected to come here and to escape another failure, a painful, unexpected divorce. One minute, Jim and I are celebrating our 15th wedding anniversary. The next minute, he tells me there's this woman at work he really likes. In fact, it's the first time he's ever been attracted to somebody else. Five weeks later, he's gone. Packed the dogs, moved to California, and is living with her. The divorce only came through one month after I started working here, and I am still reeling from the loss. My self-confidence is at an all-time low, and I feel like a midlife crisis cliche. So I think, you know, I have to explain to this integrity officer what's going on here. I said, listen, you know, I, I was hired nine months ago to fix this broken department, and I've had to discipline staff, and I think that is where this complaint is coming from. Ma'am, do not speculate on who may have submitted that anonymous complaint. If you try and figure out who did it, you may be charged with, an, uh, with retaliation. Do not speak of this complaint or investigation to anyone. We will conduct a thorough investigation. We will talk to all of your staff and all of your colleagues. Just proceed with business as normal. Oh, yeah. Normal? Normal? How am I supposed to be normal? I mean, I am freaking out. I don't know who submitted the complaint. It, it could be anybody, and since I don't know who did it, I can't fully defend myself. And now he tells me I can't talk to anybody about it, so I can't get any support. I feel utterly and completely alone. My phone rings. It's my contractor. Oh, dear God. I forgot I just closed on a new apartment the day before. And today, they started demolition to make my apartment more wheelchair accessible. I am totally trapped now. There is no way I can leave it. I feel like an animal caught in the corner. The investigation begins. We all pretend like nothing unusual is going on, but my staff disappear one at a time to be interviewed. My colleagues mentioned to me in the hallway that they too have talked with the Institutional Integrity Office and I just smile and make no comment. But inside, I am dying. What, what are these people saying about me? Do they believe I'm a racist? This goes on for months. I cry everywhere all the time. I'm trying really hard to suppress my emotions so that I don't break down in the workplace, but I mean, I often come home from a meeting, go to my desk, shut the door, and then I sob as quietly as possible. I have lost all faith in myself and my future. My only source of sucre are Dan and Georgia, longtime friends, an older couple in their 60s, and when I tell them the divorce has finally come through, they say, oh, Jim is such an idiot. 
And then when I tell them about the complaint and the investigation, they say, what credible institution gives credence to an anonymous complaint? I moved in with Diane and Georgia when I moved to DC because I was really broke from the divorce and they're the only people I know with a wheelchair accessible home. Dan uses a wheelchair too. And I thought I'd only be there for like a month or two, but it's going on a year now. One night, Dan and I are watching a movie together and I'm splayed out on the sofa. Dan rolls over to me in the chair and he says, when are you gonna show me? Show you what? I wanna see your breasts. I want to touch them. I flee in horror and now Dan won't look at me and he won't talk to me and I am just trying to pretend that nothing has happened at all and I want to leave, I really want to leave, but my apartment's not gonna be remodeled for, finished for five more weeks and I don't have the money to stay in a hotel, which is my only wheelchair accessible alternative, so I am just stressed out of my mind. A Couple days after that, my friend Maria calls me and says, hey, I gotta go work out at LA Sports. Why don't you meet me afterwards for a drink? Oh yeah, I need a drink. Um, but I think, you know, okay, I'll do that. And while you're working out, I'm gonna get a massage. So I call and I book some guy. So then I'm lying on the massage table and it's extra soft and comfy, which is really nice. And the lights are dimmed low and there's the soothing sound of water moving through fountains and this guy, Ken, comes in. A nice Ken, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, you know, I am, I, I've been under a little stress lately, so I would really like some deep tissue work. And he says, all right, I do a special kind of deep tissue work. It's called feeling body therapy. I teach people how to live through their heart. Now, that sounds kind of froofy, but that really resonated with me because the last two years I was in New Mexico, my, one of my alternative healers kept telling me, Ann, you need to learn to live through your heart. And I kept thinking, okay, fine, but how do you do that? What do you do? I don't know. So when he said that to me, I was like, oh, I have been looking for you. You go right ahead, knock yourself out. He takes my head into his hands and he, starts kneading the, the knots in my neck, and I just go, oh, that feels so good. And then he slides his hands to my waist, and he slowly pulls them up on the middle of each side of my back, using my body weight for pressure, and my muscles start to loosen. And then he takes his thumbs, and he digs them into my shoulders, and he starts kneading out those knots, and oh, I am really starting to relax now. I can feel myself unwind. And then I start to feel cold. And then I start to shiver. And then my body is shaking uncontrollably and my teeth are chattering. And I look at Ken, bewildered, and he says, say, I am afraid. Huh. I don't understand, but I say it, and that shaking becomes this convulsing, and I, these emotions are coming up from deep in my gut, and I am heaving, sobbing, all those feelings of shame and sorrow and fear from the divorce and the complaint and the loss of reputation and job and having no place to go just comes sobbing out, and it goes on and on and on. Finally, my body goes still. <laughs> I just lay there. And I say to Ken, I am so tired. I have never felt this tired before in my entire life. And he said, you're feeling what it costs you to tamp down those emotions all this time. I feel like I'm stoned. That's the expansion of your awareness from releasing those emotions. And then it hit me. I had been doing this all wrong. I thought the smart thing to do was to suppress these emotions because they scared me and I really didn't want to look at them. 
But now I realize if I had let them flow through me, if I had just looked at them one at a time as they came up, I would have seen that they were just fears and empty and hollow, and I, I wouldn't have created this huge crisis for myself. That was a new beginning for me. I kept working with Ken, and I got my self-esteem back. I moved into my new apartment, and my friendship with Georgia and Dan survived. And more importantly, I kept my job because I was exonerated in the investigation. In fact, there is a 37-page report <laughs> with the statements of 19 witnesses that say, I am not a racist. 